No one man can ever speak for all that is India or tell the age-old story of her countless generations. No one Hindu temple can reveal the spirit of the great god Brahma or breathe full life into the ancient sagas of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Indeed, there is no true way to make known the boundless nature of this land, for India is changeless, yet ever-changing. Where thousands live together in the cities of the coast and of the plain, one can see most clearly the changes that the centuries have wrought. Bullock-drawn carts no longer dominate the road, but rather slow its traffic. And in what once would have been palaces, ordinary people work and live, taking pleasure in comforts that their forefathers would have marveled at. Those who understand the spirit of machines tell of an abundant future that belongs to India. Others, clinging to their heritage, speak out against the modern ways, proclaiming their eternal faith in the hearts and hands of India's people. A thousand other voices can be heard, talking of the old and of the new, of the east and of the west. And while no single voice can speak for all that is my country, I shall try to explain part of the whole, that part which I know well. What I know of India is not the turmoil of her cities, for to me, as to any farmer, India is the land, the generous soil that has given me my living. The streams and the canals that have watered it with rains from distant hills. And equally, India is the village where those who cultivate the land find shelter. I have grown old in the rice paddies of the south. My son has taken my place in the fields. Yet these things I shall not speak of. Rather will I tell you of my grandson, Prakasham, who in his youth listened to a missionary from across the seas and now is a Christian evangelist, a layman who preaches the gospel. Months ago, Prakasham stopped near the banks of the river Godavari in the humble village of Uttaranka. As in a thousand other villages, there is a temple at whose doors the elders often gather to discuss the times. And, of course, there is a well, a never-ending source of water and of gossip. Uttaranka is a simple village. The pattern of its life is old. At the side of the road, the potter turns his clay just as it was turned a thousand years ago. Above him, the slanting sun is a timepiece drawing men from the nearby fields to their homes. Men like Ramaya, the village elder, and his son. This was the village where my grandson Prakasham halted in his travels, and the family of Ramaya were those whom he first encountered when he bound the injured wrist of Sitima, a favorite granddaughter. Yet the sight of this bandage displeased Ramaya. He didn't like to return home and find a stranger ministering to his family, and also it's easy to suspect the generosity of a stranger. And Ramaya was proud. But these things Prakashim understood, and he explained his mission to those who stood about him, telling them of a God whose word was love, and a God whose followers practiced as well as preached the ways of charity. As Prakasha moved away, there was wonder 
in the hearts of Ramaya and his family. No stranger can arrive unnoticed in an Indian village. Indeed, if he wishes to be heard, he will not find it difficult. When he had finished his Christian song, Prakasham began to speak. Some of those who listened could not believe the story of a God whose strength was love and whose anger was forgiveness. And with growing suspicion, they saw the uncertainty of the children turn to eagerness as Prakasham handed out pictures of the Bible stories. A moment later, when he moved to where the men were standing, several among them refused the tracts he offered. They resented a Christian coming uninvited to preach to them, Yet those who accepted and read the words, blessed are the peacemakers, knew at least that he was an honest man who believed in the message that he spread abroad. Day after day, the story of the gospel moved from tongue to tongue, and among the village elders, there were some who vigorously opposed it. But of them all, it was Venkana who showed most clearly how he felt. All at once, his sleeping faith had sprung alive. Now he wanted every man to proclaim the beliefs of his fathers. Now, he called on Ramaya to pledge his allegiance to the past. For those who were friendly to the Christian must be stopped. And thus it was that Ramaya, whose faith was weak, joined the holy dance. <laughs> As the body must seek refreshment, so must the spirit. Prakasham walked many miles to the mission chapel at Rajamundri, and there he prayed for help in his task. Quietly at the altar of God, he found new strength, and when he rose from his knees, the doubts that had beset him disappeared as once again he turned his steps toward Uttaranga.
When at last he was back among the people he had left, Prakashim felt that his journey had been fruitful. For I know that in his youth, he has sown many a bed of rice and can tell when a seed is taking root. Now, as he spoke, he glanced at the faces about him, and in them he sensed the hope of a Christian harvest. Soon the Bible pictures followed the word into many homes, and children made a place of honor for them on the walls. But every picture has a story, and Sitama began at once to ask her grandfather about the man called Jesus. Yet Ramaya was patient with her questions, for he himself wondered what sort of man this was, whose followers would work unselfishly for others. And as Ramaya talked, a Christian picture was discovered in the home of Venkana. For more than a week, Prakashim had been absent, visiting another village. But this time, when he returned, he was not alone. At his side were Kamalama, a Bible woman, and a catechist named Petro. These were the ones whom the mission had sent to nourish the seeds that he had planted in Uttaranka. Weeks before, Prakashim had arrived a stranger. Now, for the catechist, there was a path of friendship, and he soon knew many of the people. The introduction of Kamalama was less easy, for here it is the custom that only men should preach, and the women were not sure how to receive her, but she lingered among them, and as they performed their homely duties, she talked to them as Prakashim had not been able to. With the passing of the days, the Bible woman made herself known. Though there were doors that still were closed to her, she found good friends among the villagers, women who welcomed her visits. Never did she fail to help, and when the tasks were done, they listened with open hearts to the Christian message that she brought. Every village in India is proud of its well, yet when she noticed that this well was little cared for and unclean, Kamalama spoke out, urging its repair. For while she knew that this might give offense, she remembered the warning of the mission doctors. It was not long afterwards when the village received a visit from what the mission called its Mobile Clinic, a dispensary on wheels, which traveled through the countryside, spreading good health. While the doctors and their helpers unloaded equipment, Petru went about the village encouraging men who were sick to attend the clinic and persuading those who were afraid that the doctors had come only to help them. With the same good purpose, Kamalama worked among the women. Many of the villagers who stood about the clinic were afflicted only with curiosity but others 
who bore the traces of disease and of pain, waited quietly for the doctors to attend them. One by one, they received the best of care, as well as medicine. While the doctors comforted and advised all who came to them, Hetero carried on his search among a group of children, looking for any who seemed in need of care. And in the face of one, he did find illness. And together they set off to seek permission of his parents that the boy might be examined. But they came to a home where the science of the Christian doctors was despised. For this it happened, was the son of Venkana. After the clinic had moved on, Kamalama found there was a deeper interest in her stories of a savior who healed. Now she began to teach and those who listened heard the very words which I myself have learned from my grandson, Prakasham. And the words rang out, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And this was what she taught them, carefully explaining every word. And indeed, some of them, like the daughters-in-law of Ramaya, began slowly to understand. What the Bible woman taught was carefully noted in Uttaranka, particularly at the well. Here those who had never bothered to listen to Kamanama voiced their disapproval. At first their gossip had been idle, but all at once it became hostile when they turned upon the women of Ramaya's house, who had been friendly to the Christians, asking why they should want water from an unclean well and sending them away. Puzzled, and unhappy, the two young women carried home their empty pots, pots that now seemed heavier than when they had been full. And as they told what had happened at the well, Ramaya saw in this the work of an enemy. But though he was angry, he did nothing, for it was known that Venkana had called the native doctor, being sorely troubled by the illness of his son. Like Kamalama, Pertharu also had been teaching. For many an hour he had talked to them of the patriarchs and the prophets, until they began to understand the greatness of our Heavenly Father. For many a day he had explained the message of the gospel until they recognized the love of Jesus Christ. Now, as he taught them the catechism, he saw that already there were a few, including the sons of Ramaya, whose hearts were touched by the Holy Spirit. And Pietro knew the day was not far off when in Uttaranka there would be many Christians. At last that day arrived. A table and a cross became an altar. A courtyard covered only by the heavens became a church. And before those who waited stood a pastor 
who had come to them from the mission at Raja Mundri. As they worshiped together, he said, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. These were the words that he spoke to them, words which had echoed round the world. And when the scriptures had been read, the pastor asked those who would be baptized to come forward. While the members of his family were baptized, Ramaya had been near. But now that it was done, he moved away, pondering what he had seen. It is natural that a father should rejoice in the happiness of his children. Yet deep in his heart, Ramaya felt alone. Wrapped in a hundred thoughts, he wandered through the village until at last he found himself before the temple, where the elders often gathered to consider the times. Here, reflecting on the future, he began to see the weakness of his ties to the past, when suddenly his thoughts were interrupted by Venkana, who had been inside pleading for the life of his son. And when Ramaya learned that the boy was failing, he thought of nothing but to help. At the bedside of the sick child, the two men talked as friends. There was no trace of bitterness in what Ramaya said. And when he advised that the boy be moved to where the Christians had their hospital, he found that Venkana spoke softly and finally agreed that his son would not get well in Uttalanka. So they talked of what to do, and they decided. Within the hour, a litter was ready at the door, standing where Petru once had stood when his offer of help was rejected. Yet now that same help was being sought, for Venkana was taking his son to Raja Mundri to return the visit of the Christian doctor. Step by step, they left the country roads behind. 
And although the city streets were crowded as they passed through Rajamundri, the pace of their journey barely slackened. Thinking only of the boy, they moved steadily ahead until at last they caught sight of their goal, the Lutheran Hospital, whose gates are never closed to any man, no matter who he is. As they approached and eased their burden to the ground, Venkana looked about him with new eyes. What he saw filled him with a spirit he had never known before. In the buildings and in the faces around him, he saw the evidence of Christian purpose. And while he watched the nurses gently helping his son, he knew that all of this was good. Even as they led the boy away, he felt no doubt for something greater than hope, a sense of calm had filled his heart, though where it came from, he did not know. Days became weeks, and everywhere the signs of harvest festivals appeared. Yet none was more colorful than that in Uttaraka, where there was good reason to celebrate. When Sittama had finished blowing up the last balloon and the final garland had been hung on the pavilion, the festivities slowly began. One by one, the villagers arrived, gathering together in friendly groups, and all of them brought thank offerings, gifts which showed their gratitude for all their blessings. Some brought money, others gave a portion of their goods, like the fine black hen that Venkana had brought. Everyone was there in a holiday mood, but no one arrived empty-handed. For though the people came to enjoy themselves, the things they gave were for a purpose. That purpose was to build a church. Every orange was a brick for the walls, and every squash was a tile for the roof. Moving among them, Kamalama wondered when that church would be built. But she knew that when she and Pietru were sent on to other villages, they would leave behind them here the most important part of any church, a strong and faithful congregation. Indeed, all of those who had come the Christians and their Hindu friends alike were glad that there should be such harmony in Uttaraka. And together, they rejoiced. Hour after hour, the harvest festival went on. But before the day had run its course, a man stepped back from the crowd and took his leave. His going was noted only by a few, but I know that is the custom of my grandson, Prakasha, to leave a village as quietly as he comes. For it is Prakasha who moves off, knowing that his work in Uttalanka is done. Alone, he makes his way across the land. Yet every stranger is his friend. And in the word of God, he finds companionship along the Indian road. Where he is today, I cannot tell you. Near the coast, perhaps, or in the hills. But I know that he is not far from a village and that he does not want. The ministry of a true evangelist is to every man, to the young and to the old, to the family in its home, to the traveler who rests by the side of the road. 
to all of them, my grandson brings the healing message of the gospel, a message that he tells in deeds as well as words. For to speak of charity is not enough, and the binding of a wound will often win a soul. What I know of India is not the turmoil of her cities. For to me, India is the land. And while I cannot speak for all that is my country, I have told you those things which I know well. Yet of all these things, what I know best is the story of Prakashan. And this is not only because he is my grandson. For to me, his is the story of a missionary faith that has come to my country, a faith that carries men far from their homes to heal and preach and lift the shadows from the earth. And so long as Christians work to sustain that faith, I see hope for my village, for my country, and for the world. <laughs>